Good evening, one and all. We welcome you all to the international webinar series on holistic health, well being, and sustainable development 2022 2023 commemorating Azadi Kamrat Mahotsu, nation celebrating 75 years of independence. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2015 to 2030 as part of awareness and campaigns in collaboration with Sri Holistic Health Foundation India and Sri Research Institute Center for Art, Sciences and Wellbeing. Before we start our sessions, let's take the blessings of Almighty. With the blessings of Almighty, we shall continue with today's sessions. Today is International Polar Bear Day. Polar bears are the most affected by the climate change due to global warming. We have seen that glaciers are melting, especially the Arctic and Antarctic poles. The South and North poles are seeing rise in temperatures, which were minus 20 degrees and uh, so on. Now the temperature there seems to rise up to 20 degrees, that is plus 20 degrees. So you can see, imagine animals like polar bears, which were adapted to minus 20, now have to adapt to 20 degrees centigrade. So this is a kind of, you know, huge change that is being impacted. And you can imagine how much these poor animals, especially polar bear, is suffering from this extreme climate change. This is not just uh, one animal. There are many animals living, many species living in such areas which are hugely impacted, seals, penguins, and a lot more. So this day, International Polar Bear Day, raises awareness on the issues faced by the polar bears and the ways in which we can reduce our carbon footprint. Climate change is a huge threat to the polar bears' existence, and it's up to us to take action and protect their future. Polar bears are classified as marine mammals, carrying with them a thick layer of body fat and a water repellent coat to keep them insulated against the icy cold air and water they encounter on the sea ice of the Arctic Ocean. With their territory melting away beneath them, International Polar Bear Day is an important opportunity for us to remind ourselves what is at stake here, preserving the future of these magnificent animals.
it has been difficult for scientists to track down the origins of the polar bear, but a recent discovery in Norway may have provided uh, the answer to some extent. A rare jawbone found in the Norwegian island of uh, Svalbard in 2004 allowed scientists to estimate that the species first walked on the planet around 1,50,000 years ago and earlier. Indigenous cultures have lived in the Arctic and hunter polar bears for thousands of years, contributing towards a balanced Arctic ecosystem. The all changed in the 1700s when hunters from Europe, Russia, and North America began to rapidly cut into the polar bear population. Without any regulations, people were able to trap as many polar bears as they were killed, and the species suffered because of it. By the 1950s, things were getting worse due to increasing use of fossil fuels. The burning of coal, oil and gas melted the sea ice, causing ocean levels to rise and changing the landscape of the polar bear's environment. Environmental groups began to push back on the polar bear's behalf, but their protest often fell on deaf ears as governments ignored their pleas to do more to protect the Arctic in turn polar bears. In 1973, the US, Denmark, Norway, and former USSR signed the International Agreement on the Conservation of Polar Bears and their habitat. The agreement regulated commercial hunting and the US government classified polar bears as endangered. The non-profit organization, Polar Bear International, was formed in 1994 and they made it their mission to establish action programs to protect the endangered polar bear. They introduced the first International Polar Bear Day in 2011, and it has been celebrated every year since. Polar Bear International creates the International Polar Day to spread awareness through research, education, and activities. In 2011, polar bears are considered to be endangered by the US, Denmark, Norway, and the former USSR. The Russia and commercial hunting is regulated in 1973. The burning of fossil fuels melts the sea ice and puts the population of polar bears at risk and accelerating climate change in 1950s. Hunters from Europe, Russia and North America disrupt polar bears ecosystem with unregulated hunting, killing them, capturing it and leading to endangered species status of polar bears in 1700s. So today, February 27th is also National Polar Bear Day and International Polar Bear Day. So in countries around Arctic Circle, such as Canada, Russia, Greenland, and Norway, polar bears live in Arctic region. Polar bears don't hibernate as brown bears do. And polar bears can run 24 miles per hour. And they can be as fast as it can. So familiarize, familiarize yourself with the politics that affect the environment. Research local and national representatives to learn their stance on climate change and keep that in mind.
when you cast your support, you can also reach out to representatives and let them know that the environment is important to you. Polar Bear International has various tools to raise awareness for this cause. And make a difference close to home with community action and uh, reducing carbon footprint. The four challenges include information about thermostat conservation, rules for electronics, transportation accounts, and bicycling information. You can make difference even from home. Polar bears are largest carnivorous land mammals on the earth and are king of Arctic. The large a large male polar bear can weigh up to 1,700 pounds and that can double after a successful hunting season. So it can uh, gain winter weight. And polar bears are primarily meat eaters and feast on the seeds. So they are carnivorous. Female bears have the longest known fasting period of any mammal species of about 180 days. So they do fasting for a record period of 180 days. And underneath their white fur is the black skin to soak up the sun's warmth, skin deep. So it's not too late to turn this dire situation around. Research has shown that if we can reduce carbon emissions, the sea ice and polar bears can still recover. Polar bears are vital to the ecosystem. The Arctic ecosystem is fragile and if polar bears go extinct, it could start a chain reaction that will be harder to turn around. Less ice on Arctic means less heat is reflected away from Earth and our planet will experience more intense heat waves as a consequence. That's why we are seeing, you know, every year the summer is becoming hotter and hotter. And we also need to consider the impact of rising sea levels, especially in coastal communities and the damage to our crops. Polar bears are perfectly suited to their environment. From their furry anti-slip feet to the tips of their small heat-conserving ears, they are impressive animals roam across vast areas, sometimes up to 6 lakh square kilometers to find food and mates to coincide with the International Polar Bear Day. Let's learn about this magnificent animal and we have our own ways to celebrate and commemorate and bring awareness on these magnificent mammals. You can also adopt a polar bear and help to focus on raising funds to help protect moms and cubs of polar bears, giving them the best possible chance of survival. On average, only about half of the cubs reach adulthood with even lower survival rates in the most vulnerable populations. Right now, polar bears, moms and their newborn cubs are snuggled together in snow dens across the Arctic. 
Denning is the most vulnerable time in a polar bear's life and is warm and in a warming Arctic where polar bears face enormous charge, challenges, the survival of every single cub is critically important. Polar bear cubs are born in winter dens hidden under the snow. At birth, they are blind, weigh little more than one pound and have a, only a light layer of fur to protect them from the cold. Families remain in the den until spring when the cubs are finally large enough to survive the rigorous of the outside Arctic conditions. Keeping moms and cubs safe while addressing climate warming is a critical part of the work on behalf of polar bears and your support can really make a difference. Each year, around January 1st, polar bear moms give birth to tiny helpless cubs weighing only about one kilogram, the size of a block of butter. The family spends most of the winter snuggled up in a den with mom nursing her babies. These tiny cubs are completely reliant on their mother and their only food source is her milk. Compared to the milk you put on your cereal, which is usually one to 3% fat, polar bear milk starts around 31% fat. When cubs are first born, the fatty milk helps them grow quickly. In only two or three months, the cubs can already be 10 times bigger than when they were born. And once they're strong enough, mother polar bears know it's time to emerge from their dens.
Spring is a very special time of year for polar bear moms and their newborn cubs. The family has just emerged after having spent most of the winter snuggled together in a den. This is the first time the cubs will feel the sun on their faces, the cold wind in their fur, and the snow crunching beneath their paws. The family will stay at their den site for a few days or weeks, giving the cubs a chance to play, explore, and strengthen their legs. The cubs are about the size of a big puppy by now, 7 to 11 kilograms. And though their mom has decided that they're ready to come out of the den, they're still totally dependent on her. It's incredible that at this point the mother polar bear has not eaten for months, all the while nursing and caring for her cubs. In the Hudson Bay region, mother polar bears can go up to eight months without food. When the mother decides her cubs are ready, they begin the trip from their den to the vast frozen ocean where seals are abundant and mom can fatten up again. Hopefully, her cubs are strong and mom has enough energy for the long journey ahead. Bears near the Hudson Bay sometimes walk for a week or more and can cover over 100 kilometers to get to the sea ice. Though she's focused on finding seals to feed her family, mom will continue to nurse her cubs for as long as they're with her. As they grow older, the cubs will need less milk and more solid food. The good news is that spring is when seals give birth to their pups in snow caves on the sea ice. This means easy meals for hungry families. At this point, the cubs begin their new journey, learning how to be a polar bear in their Arctic home. From walking on the shifting sea ice, to swimming in frigid water, to avoiding potentially dangerous males, a mother polar bear will begin teaching her young cubs not only how to hunt, but how to simply survive in the Arctic. She has just over two years to teach her cubs everything they need to know to live on the frozen ocean. When a polar bear is looking for something to eat, they're looking for seals. That is where it's at for polar bears. Only seal blubber provides enough energy to power the biggest bear on the planet. Polar bears are good swimmers, but seals are a tough catch. Seals are much faster, so it's very difficult for bears to hunt them in open water. On the sea ice, polar bears can pounce on seal pups hidden in snow caves, patiently wait for a seal to come up for air at a breathing hole, or try to sneak up on a seal from behind an ice ridge. The Arctic is a harsh place to survive. There are no food sources on land with enough calories to sustain entire polar bear populations in the long term. Polar bears have adapted over the centuries to a life on the sea ice. Sub-zero temperatures, frigid winds, ice, snow, and long dark nights underneath the northern lights. Surviving winter in the Arctic is no small feat, and that's why right now, mother polar bears and their newborn cubs are snuggled together in dens hidden under the snow. Denning is the most vulnerable time in a polar bear's life. 
and keeping moms and cubs safe while also addressing climate change is a critical part of our work on behalf of polar bears. Polar Bears International has a long history of denning research, and from this work, one thing is abundantly clear. A safe and uninterrupted denning period is essential for the survival of polar bear cubs. At birth, polar bear cubs are blind, weigh about one pound, and have only a light layer of fur to protect them from the cold. A polar bear den is a warm, safe place for small cubs to grow until they're strong enough to survive outside in their frozen home. Current tools used to find and hence protect denning moms and cubs miss 55% of known polar bear dens. As the Arctic becomes more accessible and commercial activity grows, these vulnerable polar bear families are increasingly in harm's way. Right now we need better technology to locate dens. Protecting dens means protecting cubs. To develop this technology in one of the harshest places on Earth, we need your help. Your support can make a real difference. Will you help us fund this critical work to protect moms and cubs today? Denning is a critical and vulnerable time in a polar bear cub's life. After years of studying the denning behaviors of polar bears and testing the ability to find dens hidden under the snow, two things are clear. First, a stable and uninterrupted denning process is essential to the survival of polar bear cubs. The loss of cubs contributed to the 40% decline of the southern Beaufort Sea polar bear population between 2000 and 2010. Second, Aerial forward-looking infrared, or FLIR, surveys used to locate and protect maternal dens from disturbance have been missing over half of the polar bear dens known to be within surveyed areas. In a new research paper, FLIR surveys conducted by oil field operators between 2004 and 2016 found that only 45% of known dens were detected. FLIR can be an incredibly effective tool for research when conditions are just right. However, weather and other factors impact the accuracy of FLIR surveys, which is likely only to decline as global warming continues, bringing with it more unpredictable weather. Limitations of this technology suggest that denned mothers and cubs may be increasingly in harm's way. Given the threats to the southern Beaufort Sea polar bear population and increasing difficulty using FLIR in real-world conditions, scientists emphasize the importance of developing and testing other den detection methods. As the Arctic continues to warm and sea ice melts, the challenges polar bears face are immense, especially polar bear mothers and their cubs.
Polar bears live across the Arctic in some of the coldest places on the planet. They walk across the Arctic sea ice looking for their main prey, seals. And they have some traits that help them the Arctic sea ice looking for their main prey, seals. And they have some traits that help them do this and survive in this crazy cold environment. Polar bears have very thick fur that helps keep them warm. In fact, they have two layers of fur. They have a thick, fuzzy, downy layer right next to their skin, which would be like us wearing a woolly sweater. And then they have a layer of guard hairs, longer hairs over top. It's kind of like their raincoat. And these two layers of fur help keep them warm even when it's minus 40 degrees. Polar bear hair is clear and hollow. It just looks white to our eyes. And the hollowness helps trap warm air against their bodies. Polar bear skin is black. We don't really know why, but we think it might help them absorb heat. Polar bears have an amazing sense of smell. Their nose has so much surface area to pick up scents in the air. They can smell prey over a kilometer away when the wind is right. Polar bears have huge paws. They can be the size of dinner plates. The big paws help spread out the polar bear's weight on the sea ice so they can walk along really thin ice if they have to. Polar bear feet can also get smelly. When females are ready to mate, they send out signals through smelly footprints on the sea ice. And a male polar bear who picks up the scent will follow a female, sometimes for days on end. Polar bear paws are also kind of sticky. They have bumps or papillae on the bottom of their feet that help grip the ice as they're walking, kind of like your winter tires. They also have fur on their feet to help keep them warm and really sharp claws that help give them traction on the ice so they don't slip. Polar bear claws are thick and sharp. Their claws help them pull out slippery seals from underneath the water up onto the sea ice. Polar bears also have very big heads with really sharp teeth that helps them hunt their prey seals. You can see they've got big canines at the front and then they've got very sharp back molars that help them shear blubber and fat off of their prey. The diastema, or the gap, between the front sharp canines and the back molars is perfect for helping polar bears grab a seal out of the water and pull it out onto the sea ice. You can see that all of these adaptations make a polar bear perfectly suited to live in the Arctic. They need sea ice to travel, hunt, find mates, and sometimes to den. Please join us in taking action to help conserve polar bears and the sea ice they depend on. My name is PJ Kirschhofer, and I'm leading the polar bear maternal den study and the synthetic aperture radar study here in Svalbard, Norway. Synthetic aperture radar is a unique tool that uses movement of a vehicle to image a large area. So in our case, this time it's a helicopter. We pulled some measurements inside the helicopter, cut some aluminum pieces, weld them together to build almost like a replica of the bench inside the machine. So this whole rig could just kind of sit on the seat, almost like a seated human. 
Transit times can be like 45 minutes, maybe on up to an hour to the actual den site from town. Once we get to the immediate area, then the door is rolled open and there's a guidance system for that pilot to be able to follow. It's almost like uh, maybe a 90s video game where you would be flying through boxes and as the pilot's flying, you can guide the aircraft at the right altitude, the right speed, and the right direction in order to image exactly what we want to image down on the ground below. What is returned is actual data. Each pixel out there, we know where it is, it's geo-referenced, and differing images can be created from that. And that's what we're hoping to see, is that there's some sort of anomaly in the snowpack right where that bear is. Hopefully then, you know, kind of a model could be built of that. We can say this is what a polar bear den looks like under these conditions with SAR, and let's go test it somewhere else where there's high density polar bear dens and, and put some cameras on and see if things actually come out of the snow. For areas where there's human activity, if we can say with certainty there's dens here and here, then we can say these are areas that we should protect for that window of time that bears are den. And then once the bears are gone, you know, the human activity can continue. But at least during that critical time, the synthetic aperture radar can say this is where we need to be very careful in the spring months. I think field days are especially important this day and age because we have so many electronics out in the field that are able to gather data for us. You know, what that means though is that we're spending a lot of time in the office behind computers kind of looking at data instead of the animals that we're studying themselves. And I think the more time you can spend in the field, there's kind of subtle clues on what's happening out there that help unlock the entire story and that's ultimately what we're trying to do. So field days are super important and it really is a gift to be able to come to a place like this, to be able to do work and get out there and spend some time in the environment that polar bears call home. Polar bears live throughout the Arctic, where they make a living by hunting seals on the surface of the sea ice. But not all sea ice is equal. Some sea ice lies over biologically rich waters with lots of seals. Other sea ice lies over deep, unproductive waters. Some sea ice melts each summer, while other areas of the Arctic Ocean are covered with sea ice year-round. Because the polar bear's sea ice habitat literally melts as temperatures rise, Human-caused global warming means polar bears have less and less sea ice to hunt on in the summer months. Studies show that some polar bear populations are already declining due to longer fasting periods. However, in other more northerly areas where there's more sea ice or in areas with lots of seals, polar bears may not be impacted yet. Ultimately, all polar bears will be affected as global warming continues. In 2010, Dr. Amstrup led a study showing that unless we greatly reduce carbon emissions, two-thirds of the world's polar bears could disappear by the end of the century. This was a monumental warning. But it left a new, big, unanswered question. Exactly when? When will polar bears begin to disappear in different parts of the Arctic? 
Now, through the efforts of a team of CI scientists and ecological modelers brought together by Dr. Amstrup, we finally have some more details to answer that question. In this new study, data from polar bears fasting on land was used to determine how many days polar bears can go without sea ice before reproduction and survival decline rapidly. These estimates were intersected with climate model projections of how many ice-free days polar bears will face in different places around the Arctic. To make these models, the amount of sea ice was derived from two greenhouse gas emissions scenarios. The first scenario models what will happen to polar bears if people take no action on climate change and continue to maximize use of fossil fuels with business as usual carbon emissions. In this scenario, the average end of century temperature is 3.3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. This would mean that a few populations of polar bears may survive in the most northern parts of their current range, but most would collapse by the end of the century. That's only 80 years from now, a human lifetime. The second scenario models what will happen if people make moderate reductions to carbon emissions, with an average end of century temperature increase of 2.4 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. In this case, more polar bear populations may persist to the latter part of this century. Although this scenario is better in the short term, the long-term temperatures would still continue to rise beyond 2100, exceeding the warmest periods that have occurred during the polar bear's evolutionary history, and their long-term future would still not be assured. Ideally, we would follow a different scenario, one not modeled here, where people come together and take swift, bold action as a global community to meet the goals set during the Paris Agreement and keep global temperature rise below two degrees. This is still an option. There is still time to act. Doing so could preserve polar bears over much of their current range indefinitely. Polar bears show us the consequences that a warming world brings, both for the Arctic and for the rest of the planet. The future of polar bears is interconnected with our own we can choose to rapidly decrease our reliance on fossil fuels and make a swift transition to renewable energy. Doing so would not only protect polar bears, but ecosystems and species around the world, including us. All around the Arctic, polar bears depend on the sea ice. Now, they don't eat ice, but they catch their prey from the surface of the sea ice. Have a range that's called circumpolar. That means if you looked at the top of the globe, it goes all the way around. But the sea ice isn't the same everywhere. And in 2007, I realized that it's really important for us to figure out how and why the ice is different and why bears might respond differently to it. And I came up with the concept of four major ice ecoregions defined by how the ice forms, how it melts, how it moves according to ocean currents, and then how the polar bears respond. The first of these is what I call the seasonal ice ecoregion. This is the part of the world that includes Hudson Bay and much of eastern Canada. The ice there is composed only of annual ice, and when it melts in the summer, the polar bears are forced ashore. Historically, polar bears were able to do just fine with this environment because most of this region is shallow continental shelf water, 
and very productive. So even if bears were forced ashore for an extended period, they could gain enough weight before that happened that they could survive. They could live off, literally live off the fat of their bodies while they were waiting for the ice to come back. The problem now is that with global warming, the ice is melting sooner and it's forming later in the fall than it used to. This means less time that bears have on the ice to catch seals, more time that they have on land waiting for the ice to come back and during which time they're essentially food deprived. The seasonal ice ecoregion is one we know a great deal about because when polar bears are on land, they're a little bit easier to study than when they're out on the sea ice. We've gained opportunity to learn how important the sea ice is, but the ice there is very different than in most of the rest of the polar bear range. Rather than seasonal ice, the ice in the other three regions is multi-year or perennial ice. And that means that a big component of it remained through the summer and historically bears could stay on that ice continuing to feed reaching their peak weights in the fall instead of in the spring as they do in the seasonal ice ecoregion. From Alaska all the way around the Russian Arctic to the Svalbard archipelago north of Norway is the divergent ice ecoregion. Ice tends to form along the shoreline and then it drifts away from the shoreline out into the center of the polar basin. Some of it actually is ejected from the polar basin. But the important point is that during the summer, this concept of the ice moving with the currents away from the shore means that the ice is always trying to open up and create a gap between the shoreline and the sea ice. Now, this didn't used to be a problem because when the world was cooler, the ice never retreated very far. In fact, when I went to Alaska in the early 1980s, I could stand on the North Shore in the summertime and see the ice right there. If I was lucky and had a pair of binoculars, I might even see a polar bear out there within view of the shoreline. Now that sea ice is way offshore and that has forced polar bears into a similar challenge that they have faced in the seasonal ice ecoregion. They either have to come onto land where there's nothing for them to eat, or they follow the sea ice way out into the polar basin. And our recent studies have shown that they're not feeding when they're out there either because the water in the deep polar basin is not very productive. Now the ice from the divergent ice ecoregion is moving from shore out into the polar basin, but a lot of it piles up against the shoreline in northern Canada and also in northern Greenland. I call that area the convergent ice. The divergent ice ecoregion is kind of supplying ice to the convergent ice ecoregion. In the convergent ice ecoregion, polar bears historically didn't come ashore either. And the way the ice moves, even as the world has warmed, most of this area has remained good polar bear habitat throughout the summer because the ice is continually drifting against the shoreline there. The fourth ecoregion is the archipelago ecoregion, composed of the narrow channels of water between the high Canadian Arctic islands. They're very far north, very cold, and even with global warming, ice has persisted through this area for most of the summer and polar bears don't have to come ashore. If we allow the world to continue to warm and don't do anything about it, the last places that polar bears are likely to be is in the top of the convergent ice ecoregion and in the archipelago ecoregion. But one thing we have to remember is polar bears are dependent on the sea ice and if the world continues to warm, ultimately all of the sea ice will be gone and we won't have polar bears in any of these ecoregions.
Maternal denning is probably the most critical phase in a polar bear's life cycle. Polar bear moms go into their dens early in the winter and they stay in their dens until the spring. And at that time, their cubs need to come out with them and start a life out on the sea ice. It's an extraordinarily challenging environment. And cub survival is, is quite low, even under the best of circumstances. It's pretty cold here. Svalbard is about halfway between Norway and the North Pole. Maybe like four or five quite big islands. And it's a lot of high mountains, up to 1,700 meters. Those steep mountains is one reason why it's good denning habitats here. So you get snow that accumulates, maybe on some plateaus, and then they have hilly sides, and you get snow drifts where it accumulates enough snow for bears to actually den. So Svalbard is actually a good place for polar bear denning. Polar bears den under the snow. It is absolutely impossible to watch what's happening in the den. It's one of the last frontiers of polar bear biology as far as I'm concerned. So what we're doing, we're working closely with PBI. We are put out cameras near these dens so that we can non-invasively monitor both emergence and the behavior that follows emergence from that den. You might ask, why do we go to 78 North Latitude for polar bear dens? And actually, there's very few places on the planet where we know there's polar bear dens, and it's relatively easy to access those dens. The Norwegian Polar Institute has been putting out collars for decades now, so they have many females that we know where they den each and every year, which is really important because trying to find a polar bear underneath the snow is incredibly difficult. Here in Svalbard, looking at snowy mountainsides, all of them look the same. Some of them have some snow drifted, some have less, but any one of them almost, you know, could have a polar bear hiding in them. Our field team spends a lot of time analyzing each one of the radio collar locations before we head out into the field to actually place the gear. Depending on the location and distance and maybe even weather, sometimes we're using helicopters to get out to these places, sometimes we use snowmobiles, and sometimes it's just a pair of skis. First day in the field, the weather was beautiful. The sun was just over the horizon and it's coming back to Svalbard in the north right now. But the temperatures were quite harsh. We had minus 30 centigrades. We had to make sure that we bundled up for the weather outside. But we were towing sleds, so that kept us warm and running and the entire operation was quite brief. So it was a rather uh, enjoyable adventure. The cameras that we're now using are all custom built by our team for the purpose of this project. We have a Raspberry Pi computer with a lens and screen attached. There's a battery in there and it fits inside of a almost suitcase sized Pelican case, which makes us so much more nimble, especially for the challenging terrain here in Svalbard. On the outside of the system, we have a flexible solar panel. These are really light, really neat panels. We put those up real quick and tie everything down to the ground with some guy wires. And we hit the record button and let it go. And we're able to record HD at the den sites for the entire time the females are there. Being part of the project is uh, really opening new perspectives to me as a young researcher. So I have an idea what technology can be used to further improve our study methods. Polar bears are ring species. They live all across the Arctic. Their ecosystem actually stretches over territories of multiple countries. So they don't have borders that we humans do. Coming together in conservation research, improving our studies and cooperating is essential for understanding polar bear ecology, but also to finding good conservation solutions for the future of the species. If you go back 30, 40 years in time, Svalbard was almost always connected to the ice edge, so bears could actually walk from Svalbard up to the hunting areas and back as they wanted. 
But what we have seen is that sea ice conditions have changed faster than anywhere else in the Arctic, more than twice as fast actually as any other place. So they lose their living areas. Some of the main denning areas, for example, that was traditionally very, very important for reproduction, are almost lost. So some places you don't find female polar bears denning anymore. I think, as most other polar researchers do, that uh, loss of habitat is by far the greatest threat. They are still doing fine, but they won't be able to make it, we think, if you don't have sea ice at all. So behavior in the denning areas is very important to try to understand more about their ecology. The cameras are wonderful. We can watch their behavior as soon as they come out of the den. And what that tells us is how big the cub is, how much they've grown. We can potentially backdate to when the cub was actually born. We can look at their body condition. Do they move vigorously? How does the mom look? All of this, which tells us a little bit about what was going on in the den. We can also follow that behavior once they're out of the den to what the environmental conditions are, both for the season before she went into the den and for the season that she's heading into. All of this, we can start to piece together that, that critical time that happens completely out of our view. Maternity denning in polar bears provides an extraordinary opportunity to actually witness the environment in which polar bears are being born and then raised. To be out there in conditions that are so harsh to us humans, but that they are a cradle for a future generation of bears, to witness that, it's a privilege and a humbling experience. Polar bears are one of the most difficult animals to tag and track given where they live. Bears are, are tough, they're rough and tumble. Males are sparring with each other and so keeping things attached to bears is particularly hard. So we're often asked why do you tag and track polar bears or wildlife in general. Tracking gives us a ton of information on habitat use, where animals go and what they're doing when we can't see them. An animal like a polar bear most of their life history occurs out of sight. They live in very remote places, out on the sea ice where it's quite difficult to get to and nearly impossible to get to in the dark winter months. Having devices that remotely give us information on what a polar bear or other wildlife might be doing is incredibly valuable. The challenge came to us through my son. My son works for Polar Bears International. And um, he reached out to me one day and he's going, Dad, we have a problem, we need to attach a tag to a polar bear. You work for a company that makes things stick. Can you help us make a tag stick to a bear? Recently, tags and transmitters for bear research or research in general on animals have been shrunk down. They're quite small now. We really need a better tool in order to attach these to the animal itself. Polar Bears International is working with 3M to work and look at, you know, is there better adhesives, uh, maybe some sort of uh, Velcro-like tool, or maybe a tape that could adhere this to the animal for a short amount of time. And then when the tag has outlived itself, the adhesive will simply let go and the tag will be released from the animal. From there, I turned around and went to our tech forum community. I said, can we figure out a way to do this? I put together a an event we called the Tag a Bear Challenge. It was a creative event to invite people for the couple of days to brainstorm and come up with some solutions. Here's a polar bear pelt. This is when they molt. This is how long we need this little tag to stick to the bear. Now, what can you guys do? And then from there, we went into solving those problems, developing test methodologies, and it's been about a two-year process. 
Over that time, we came up with several solutions and we've reduced it down to essentially four methodologies. Some of them are adhesive methodologies, some are mechanical methodologies, and some are hybrids of both of those. Everything we know right now about polar bears is from adult female movements. So we're missing a big chunk of the information on how other bears use habitat, how other bears move around in the subpopulation and potentially between subpopulations. So if we're successful in testing these fur tags, if they work on polar bears, it will allow us for the first time to track adult male polar bears and subadult polar bears. These tags could potentially go on bears of any size. So this will give us a lot more information on polar bear life history, and it'll really round out what we know about polar bear habitat use and how things are changing as sea ice continues to melt. This has really been a demonstration of the best of 3M. It's what has been really exciting for me about my career here. It's a challenge that I put out to the technical community and there are a group of folks that have embraced this and have helped to come up with solutions and are just as excited about it as I am. The intent is to provide the wildlife community with a platform for attaching tags, radio tags to these animals and be able to track them. Arctic and polar bears provide for some really interesting challenges and unanswered questions. I'm excited to look for new ways to use this tool to try to fill in some of the gaps and provide answers to some of those questions. Thanks to the Polar Bear International uh, for their conservation efforts. And we were uh, able to use a visual presentations to bring awareness on various issues faced by the polar bears and their environment and habitats. So the credit goes to Polar Bears International and uh, we express our gratitude to the Polar Bear International and extend our support for their conservation initiatives, for the protection and conservation of polar bears. Time is running out. Can we bring our world back to life before it's too late?
We're in a race against time to restore our world. And it's a race we must win. Join WWF, and together, we can bring our world back to life. So with this, we end the commemoration of International Polar Bears Day. And uh, coming to other commemorations, today is also Anosmia Day. Anosmia is loss of sense of smell. So, anosmia, awareness day, is a day to spread awareness about anosmia, which is loss of sense of smell, or some people call it nose blind. So, loss of smell is associated with diseases that affect brain cells, like Alzheimer's, yes, loss of sense of smell is not to be taken lightly and people need to be educated to prevent anosmia. So anosmia is the loss of one's sense of smell or olfactory function. While this might seem like a mirror concern to many people, the loss of smell leads to many serious problems for people. Smell helps people to detect danger in their environment, such as smoke and noxious fumes, Smell is also useful in eating and keeping overall good health. By celebrating Anosmia Awareness Day, we can explore the reasons for anosmia and the different treatments that can bring relief and recovery. So the medical term for the loss of smell is known as anosmia. It is most often caused by infection or injury to the nose or brain and can be temporary or permanent depending on what has happened. There are two types of loss of smell, hyposmia and anosmia. Hyposmia is a partial loss of the sense of smell, whereas anosmia is when someone has completely lost their ability to smell anything at all. So anosmia awareness day was established by Daniel's chain in 2012, Shane was diagnosed with anosmia in the fifth grade, but it was not until 2011 that he started his research about anosmia and decided to create an organization called Anosmia Awareness. He created a Facebook community for this cause. People who supported this event were read on this day. Various smell and taste institutions Institutes and charities were approached to create awareness about olfactory dysfunction. Various fundraising activities are also organized to collect funds for the research and development of the olfactory disorders. Different seminars are organized to educate people about the importance of treatments for olfactory disorders. People from different parts of the world participate in events virtually through various local, regional, national, international platforms, including social media platforms like Facebook, Zoom, Instagram, like this. And this is a non-profit organization.
to spread awareness for those without a sense of smell. They are also on the path to encourage research centers around the world to research treatment options for anosmia. Anosmia affects over 2 lakh people in the US alone, and there is no real cure or treatment for it at this time. However, many of these patients have found ways to work around. their condition with the help of others so that they can too. Losing your sense of smell can be a square thing. You may think that you are going to lose all the wonderful things in your life, like smelling flowers or tasting food. But there are some things that people will announce me are find helpful. So be strong. So this day helps to raise awareness about the loss of sense of smell. People suffering from this disorder may face difficulties to perform their day-to-day -day activities. Many people are still unaware of olfactory disorders. Anosmia Awareness Day also motivates researchers and healthcare professionals to create treatments to cure anosmia. Those who suffer from anosmia need to stay conscious at all the times as they are unable to detect gas leaks, wildfires or spoiled food with their sense of smell. Moreover, some people also find it hard to eat food without the sense of smell. Numerous studies reveal that those who suffer from olfactory disorders are more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety. Therefore, when a day is solely dedicated to people suffering from anosmia, it helps people understand mental and physical difficulties that are associated with olfactory disorders. So Hippolyte Clockett highlights the role of sense of smell in animal reproduction in 1821. And Huggling Jackson records the case of a farmer who loses his sense of smell after being kicked by a horse. The first reported case of ensomia in 1864. A detailed study about smell was conducted by Eleanor Gamby, an influential psychologist, writes a dissertation about the importance of the sense of smell in 1898. Daniel Shane is diagnosed with ensomia in the fifth grade, which was an unfortunate diagnosis in 2007. Shane began begins researching and learning about ensomia, sorry, anosmia, and plans to establish anosmia awareness in 2011. Shane launches the first anosmia awareness day in 2012. And people get to know more about anosmia through the works of anosmia awareness in 2020. So the most common causes of anosmia include nasal congestion, allergy, sinus infection, or air pollution. However, there are many fa other factors that can cause anosmia. So currently there is no known cure or treatment for congenial anosmia. However, many factors cause anosmia. There is no known treatment for people who have congenial anos uh, anosmia. People with a partial loss of their sense of smell can include concentrate flavoring in the food they can eat to improve their enjoyment of food. Anosmia is classified as an invisible disability since smell is a vital sense for humans to function properly. So the best way is by raising awareness and educating our friends and family about the disease. Learning more about anosmia and other illness that cause loss of smell. So your cell smells can regenerate and are renewed every 30 to 60 days. 
So your smell is renewed almost every month. A human being's nose can detect at least one trillion distinct scents. That's a lot. Have you ever noticed how many distinct scents you can recognize? Now start exploring on this day, from this day. Dogs can distinguish non-identical twins based on order and they have more scent cells than humans, almost 44 times more. So boys, dogs can smell you. According to research, African-Americans and Hispanics experience age-related loss of smelling earlier than Caucasians. So age-related anosmia is linked to race also. Everyone has their unique identity order similar to a fingerprint, which means no two people can smell things the same way. Smelling is unique. And the smell of a person is also unique. That's why, you know, dogs can easily identify a person with the unique smell. Like if DNA, fingerprint, your smell is also, every individual smell is unique. And Anosmia Awareness Day motivates people to take care of their ENT health. People get more familiar with the benefits of lifestyle changes and those exercises and therapies that help to minimize the signs and symptoms of anosmia. There might be some people, maybe someone from your friends or family or community circle who might be suffering from anosmia without knowing them or without them knowing. So educating them about anosmia helps them receive treatment at the right time. As of now, no cure, treatment or therapy can permanently cure congenial anosmia, that is, which is caused by birth. Anosmia Awareness Day motivates researchers to study more about olfactory dysfunction. However, some types of anosmia can be prevented or treated. If there is an underlying health problem that is triggering anosmia in a person, such as sinus infection, then steroids can be used to restore the sense of a smell by addressing sinus. Today is also National Protein Day in US. Proteins helps develop bone, skin, cartilage and blood while promoting weight loss and increased muscle mass. It can also help us stay fit throughout all stages of life. High protein foods include everything from pumpkin skins, soya and many more. And proteins are the most basic building blocks of body. So lentils are a great source of protein and there are tons of protein packed foods in vegetarian also that can be prepared in delicious ways. Ideal protein intakes varies by, by, uh, by weight. Nutrition experts recommend around 46 grams per day for women and 56 grams per men. But Age, activity level, muscle mass, physical goals, and your current health all play an important role. Examine your diet and seek advice on how much protein you need. The National Academy of Medicine actually sets a wide range anywhere between 10 to 35% of calories each day. Broccoli is a powerhouse. There are so many delicious ways to prepare broccoli. 
is a rich source for proteins. Pumpkin seeds also helps you to lose weight. Skip the oil roasted pumpkin seeds and choose dry roasted instead, which is a huge powerhouse of proteins. And we have protein throughout our bodies, muscles, bones, skin, hair, and virtually every other body part or tissue. That's why protein intake is so important in maintaining good health. Since protein increases metabolism, it provides energy to help us naturally burn calories. Replacing fat and carbs with protein suppresses appetite-increasing hormones, steering us away from those omnivorous late-night snacks. So various sources include beans, nuts, dairy, vegetables, and more. Three bridges offer certain dishes specially designed to help increase protein consumption. Soya is also a rich source for protein. You can consume it in the form of milk or meal maker or nuggets or even in the form of snacks. Today is also Dominican Republic Day as Dominicans celebrate their Independence Day. And today is also Clean Monday in Greece. which is or which marks the beginning of Great Lent period for the Orthodox believers and it is also called as Ash Monday or Pure Monday or Orthodox Shrove Monday or Monday of Lent or Green Monday uh, particularly in Cyprus. And Clean Monday is also regarded as the first day of spring and Greeks tend to celebrate it with kauloma, which are outdoor activities and picnics. It concludes with a month-long Greek carnival and symbolizes the transition from feasting to fasting. So Greek Orthodox celebrate Clean Monday by eating special Lent dishes based on legumes, vegetables, grains, And it is a popular holiday in Greece and Cyprus. So this also uh, stems from the belief that Christians should approach the fasting season of the Lent season with clean hearts and pure intentions. So Christians also use this Lenten season as a time to clean up their homes, readjust their lives, and commit themselves to the holier and more righteous lifestyle. And Monday is a day of total fasting. Christians are abstained from eating from midnight to midday and are not allowed to eat meat at all. It stands in the stark contrast of the festive mood and bring traditions to the three preceding weeks of Greek carnival, Epochrys. And this event, festival or commemoration also includes flying kites, dancing music, etc. Everyone, young and old, visit the beautiful countryside and fly their colorful kites in the sunny sky. Different areas and regions throughout the country also have special customs and local traditions associated with Clean Monday. The popular custom of flying kites on Clean Monday may have ties with ancient pagan rites. However, the Christian Orthodox Church, the kite represents the human soul flying free and pure in the sky, ready to meet the Creator.
So you can make your own colorful kites from scratch or simply buy a ready-made kites from one of the stores or street vendors and fly out your kites throughout through the winds and watch out for the winds. And Greece has about 6,000 beautiful islands and islets, islets with only around 227 of them being inhibited. And Greece is also home to 18 UNESCO World Heritage Sites, including popular sites like the Temple of Apollo, Acropolis of Athens, Mount Athos, Meteora, the medieval city of Rhodes, and the old town of Corfu. Recording about 250 sunny days and up to 3,000 hours of sunshine each year, Greece is one of the sunniest places in the world. And Greece's official name is Helen, Hellenic Republic or Hellas, and Greeks are known as Hellenes. Officially, it's not Greece. So spring is the season of growth, beauty, and greenery. Clean Monday allows us to transition to the beautiful season of spring. Today is also National Strawberry Day. devilishly sweet and delightfully low in calories, they are the perfect food to make you feel naughty and nice at the same time. Strawberries have grown in the wild for thousands of years. It was the French who brought the delicious red berry into their gardens for the cultivation in the 14th century. The berry's name may be due to number of reasons. Some argue that it comes from the Old English berge, berich, because of its straw-like fonts. Others suggest they are so-called because of the farmers mulching them with the straw. And there are also accounts that the berries were sold on straw skews at market. Its heart shape and bright red color make it a symbol of love that is perfect for the romantic month of February. And due to varied locations where strawberries are cultivated and grown, the strawberry season runs from January to November. So due to its shapes like a heart and its rich red color, the strawberry is a symbol of love and is commonly associated with Venus, the goddess of love. Today is no brainer state. to encourage people to keep things simple and resolve situations calmly without stress. It is also known as International No-Brainer Day for all those no-brainer tasks and activities. It is a terrific reminder to take it easy and not fret too much when a situation gets difficult to handle. With some patience, the solution to any problem can appear to be within reach and easy to undertake. If a project requires thinking, study of analysis of any kind, then it's not the core to do today. Leave that for another day. It's a no-brainer day. Today is also Special Operation Forces Day in Russia. President Vladimir Putin established it in 2015 
also known as special forces are military units that carry out unconventional missions both within and outside of the country special operation forces in their modern form first appeared in the early 20th century many countries nowadays have special forces as part of armed forces and finally today is national pokemon day just a few years after the pokemon craze came and supposedly went it is still going strong and uh, you probably need to know the origins of the pocket monsters fame it started uh, way back in 1996 pokemon comes from the japanese term poketo monsuta or pocket monsters So Pokemon was created by Satoshi Tajiri who was born and raised in Tokyo in 1965 from a very young age he was fascinated by insects and collected them Tajiri aspired to become an entomologist but he this was overridden by his passion for video gaming mesmerized by the arcade game space invaders his teenage years were spent gaming and learning about the medium in 1991 tajiri collaborated with nintendo on the puzzle game yoshi and he was already brainstorming a new idea for the game this game would eventually become a pokemon so pokemon was first titled capsule monsters but this was changed due to a copyright infringement it was first renamed to capumon and then pocket monsters nintendo's shigeru miyamoto was intrigued by the designs for pokemon and it didn't take long for the idea to be greenlit generation 1 pokemon red and green officially launched the whole franchise So in 1997 Pokemon was animated into a TV series in Japan the story follows a boy named Satoshi who sets out to become the greatest Pokemon's master along with his companion Pikachu in 1998 Pokemon cards were released creating one of the biggest fads of 1990s fans obsessively collected these cards and traded them to complete their collection As part of franchise's 20th anniversary celebrations, the virtual game Pokemon Go was released once again, captivating the masses. So finally today is world ngo day it is observed every year on february 27th is an acronym for non governmental organization world ngo day is a set aside to recognize celebrate and honor the fundamental contributions and profound impact that these independent organizations have had on the world ngos are non profit organizations and although they are modern phenomenon their history spans back years of hundreds of years their influence continues to grow and make positive changes where needed in today's world world ngo day was originally founded in 2009 by marcus leo scadamans a social entrepreneur however it was observed for the first time on february 27 2014 it's a day set aside to honor all non government and non profit organizations recognizing 
their impact on the world. The holiday was officially declared back in 2010 by the 12 member countries of the Baltic Sea NGO Forum, recognized as a partner of the Council of the Baltic Sea States. However, it only received international recognition in 2014 by the European Union, the United Nations, and other international organizations. An NGO has been defined by the United Nations Department of Global Communications as an organization that is not a profit, voluntary citizens group, that is set up at a local, national, or international level to address issues in support of the public good. Though NGOs date back to 18th century, the name non-governmental organization was created by the 1945 Charter of the United Nations, Article 71. Non-governmental organizations are also referred to as civil society organizations, non-profit organizations, membership organizations and charitable organizations. The distinguishing factor of NGOs is their independence from the government. NGOs are privately funded through grants, private donations, membership dues, product sales and sometimes government donations. Surveys indicate that there is a high level of public trust for NGOs which makes them a useful proxy for the concerns of society. According to the World Bank, there are two types of NGOs. They are operational NGOs and advocacy NGOs. The former focuses on designing and implementing development-related projects, while advocacy NGOs promotes, promote specific causes that impact public policy. In United States itself, there are now approximately 1.5 million NGOs in existence. So generally, how, uh, no volunteers get paid in NGOs. Depending on the nature of NGO, it may pay its employees or it may offer honorarium to the employee uh, volunteers. There is no cut and right procedure for being a volunteer as it depends on the particular NGO. However, a degree would prove useful. NGOs need to be registered and the laws of particular state they plan to operate in. The registration requirements vary from depending on the state and nations. Generally in India, NGOs are registered under Trust Act or uh, under uh, Society Registration Act or as a Section 25 company. Under Companies Act. And of course, there were a few co under uh, Cooperatives Act, but that is very rarely seen. And NGOs need the support of volunteers. So celebrate NGO Day by volunteering to promote a well worthy movement. And non profit organizations solely rely on donations to keep running. So if it is within your means, consider contributing to an NGO or World NGO Day. It's a hard work of these selfless individuals that keeps NGOs around the world active and impactful. The first step to start an NGO is to cause that you are willing to dedicate your time to advocate for. Once you have identified your passion, the next step is to set vision and mission statements to serve as a reminder and roadmap for your organization. Select people with the same vision and mission who have different skills needed to make the organization successful. After establishing your objectives and finding your dream team, it's time to make things official by registering your NGO. Now that you are on the move, Make sure to spread the word 
about your cause to attract like-minded people who will help your NGO achieve its goals. So this day provides the chance to recognize the altruistic individuals that contribute to the success of NGOs worldwide. From founders to employees and volunteers to regular supporters, we have the opportunity to show our support. There are so many worthy causes that are often overlooked. This day provides an opportunity to shine a light on those causes, especially those that are humanitarian. It not only creates awareness, but also encourages others to become involved, whether it may be through fundraising or volunteering. And also, a last word of caution, though they are doing tremendously wonderful work, Often there are many NGOs that are misusing and bringing uh, to the light the other side by exploiting, misusing funds. Which are otherwise, you know, required for the betterment and development of society. Instead, they are using for their own benefits and development. So let's use this day to recommit ourselves and uh, let's uh, support NGOs. There are many NGOs who doesn't uh, accept, uh, you know, public funding like ours, which are solely dependent on the contributions of their own members without any public uh, fundraising. So you can reach out and uh, look for genuine NGOs which are really contributing and which are really doing wonderful work. And we have different kinds of NGOs. Like we have seen majorly two types of NGOs based on their activity. One, there are different types of NGOs who do advocacy, who do field uh, on field uh, initiatives, those who are just limited to creating awareness. So it all depends on the resources, uh, time, infrastructure, and various other factors available with the NGO. And not only that, based on their NGO's uh, you know, mission and vision, and based on various uh, objectives, NGOs can have a lot of activities or they can restrict to one or other activities. And we have also political NGOs and religious NGOs. Basically, this charity model is brought by the Christian missionaries where in the name of charity, they have promoted religion and uh, today we can see how, uh, you know, a lot of religious institutions and conversions came up in the name of charity. And in fact, charity has become a commercial model. Uh, and you can see how these charity models have been flourishing with a religious motive behind. But that shouldn't be the uh, purpose of charity because charity without expectation is only the true charity. Even if you are expecting anything like even religious conversion or promotion through charity, that is the greatest sin that even God will not forgive you. If you are doing even charity for the sake of, you know, for giving food or for in, offering education or for offering shelter, if you are taking some benefit in offering charity, then you are committing the greatest sin. By taking the name of God, committing a greatest sin is the greatest sin that you can ever commit. And that is a greatest sin that can be never for, uh, forgiven by the God. So let's use this opportunity not to engage in such activities and 
make sure that we will not exploit this opportunity or this platform on this occasion of World NGO Day to misuse this great cause and contribute to the nation. So with this, we shall end today's commemorations. And thank you everyone for joining us. So see you all tomorrow at the same time. Before leaving, we request everyone to quickly fill up the feedback form raised in the form of polls. So thank you everyone. Feedback form has been raised in the form of polls. Quickly fill up the feedback form. See you all tomorrow at the same time. Take care. Good night. And it's a gentle reminder. Whoever would like to present for the upcoming international conference in uh, March, we request everyone to quickly uh, register themselves as a participant or presenter and whoever would like to nominate themselves for the awards so you can quickly register and whoever would like to collaborate you can also register and as you know that there is no language barrier and we are incorporating and implementing NEP initiatives so mother language is being promoted so you can present your papers in your own language. But for the benefit of all the participants, we request you to uh, provide a transcript, English transcript or translation of your papers so that you know participants can also become aware of what you are presenting. And they do not have this language barrier come into their way of understanding your research or presentation. So make this wonderful opportunity to utilize and break the language barriers and utilize this wonderful opportunity to present your research work and your observations. So with this, we thank everyone and see you all tomorrow. Take care. Good night.